Check one, two, check one, two. I hope you can hear me out there. We are live. Uh, sorry for the slight delay getting up and getting on, uh, but this is uh, the latest in a series of seminars that I'm doing, teaching people how to become better DJs. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to the whole Soapbox team. Big up to Young Urban Arts Official. We're teaming up on this one, so big up to Kerry and the whole team. So the idea is, is I, I'm fully aware that to practice DJing, it really helps if you've got equipment at home. You know what I mean? Uh, and for the vast majority of young people, that's often an issue because, you know, the, the cost of it. So, it, you know, it was always a, a pleasure to have young people coming through uh, the, the Soapbox Centre because we've got decks there for you to practice on. Now, the idea with these seminars is I'm going to try and pass to you as much knowledge, uh, tips, you know, just advice that I can assuming that you don't have equipment. Now, um, if you do have equipment at home, by all means, hit us up on the messaging. Or if you direct message Soapbox, we can hook you up with a, uh, a link for Zoom and you can get a more in-depth experience. So you can see what's going on with my screens. I've got my laptop set up here. Now, I've been DJing for the better part of 20 years. You know, When I started, it was all vinyl. There's been a big change a big shift in not just the music, but the technology as well, you know what I mean? So, um, uh, what, what is this? Is, who's this? Uh, Shorty Lover 2 uh, is cutting out. It's cutting out. Oh, okay. Uh, right, let me let me check what's going on here. Um, hopefully, it's just a cable issue. One second. Okay, we're getting poor connection. Hopefully, um, well, look, let's start from the beginning. Now, the idea was this was going to be a six-week course, each week covering a different topic. Um, we've already done a couple of weeks, but I'm going to retread a little bit of ground from last week's session. Reason being, you know, we're st w this is still kind of relatively new to us, you know, the, 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 we're get, still getting used to working with the technology. The idea was to record these workshops and then upload them to YouTube afterwards for people to go back and check on. And um, although we managed to get the video last week, we had no audio. So I'm going to retread a little bit of stuff that we went over last week. And um, as I said, if you've got any questions, we are currently live on both the Soapbox Instagram and the Young Urban Arts Instagram. So shout out to all the DJs out there. Big up to anyone looking to learn. Um, you know, th this is the best time to learn new skills. It's a crazy time we're living in right now. So. Um, <clears throat> last week's seminar was all about preparing a set. So I'm going to quickly just recap some of the points that I went over on that one. Now, first and foremost, when it comes to putting together a good DJ set, rule number one is you've got to have a good music collection. I spoke about this in part one of our seminar, and I don't mean like just having the music. You really, you've got to know your music, you know. And uh, what I mean by that is, Listen to it, familiarize yourself with it, understand things like the BPM, the format, how it sounds, the breakdowns. Does it come straight in or does it give you a nice long intro? Is there room on the tail end to mix it out? You know, intros and outros will vary depending on the kind of music you are playing, you know. So it's one of those things that won't happen overnight. It takes a lot of trial and error, a lot of practice. Now, I've, you know, as I said, I've been DJing for the better part of 20 years, and uh, most of that was spent collecting vinyl. If you look around, you can see my vinyl collection. I've got thousands of records. And, you know, you don't buy them all at once. You buy them a few at a time, and you would come home, like from your record digging session, whatever, sh record shopping, you bring them home, you stick them on the decks, you have a listen, you have a little play around with them. And that was quite often the first step to preparing a set. First, you know, you want to know what you've got, what's on the flip side. Is there a remix? Do you have an a cappella? Do you have an instrumental? How can I use that in the mix? But then there's also you playing the right music at the right time, you know. Now, the right music is a big part of it. I would say more than 50% of being a good DJ is being a good selector. They call them selectors for a reason because we are selecting the music that you're going to listen to. And... Um, you know, that's not necessarily about playing the most popular or the bait tunes or the, th the, the songs that you, you think are going to get a reaction. You know, um, there is a very big difference between being the warm-up DJ and then being the peak time DJ. You know, that, that, 
and also on the venue, the audience, the crowd you've gone to see. For example, one of my regular residencies before the lockdown went in was uh, Chip Shop in Brixton. Shout out to the whole Chip Shop family. Now, uh, if I was playing there on a Friday or Saturday night, just a regular free entry, that would be different to if it was a ticketed event. For example, if it's a ticketed event, chances are we would have a pretty well-established hip-hop artist playing, which meant that there was a pretty solid hip-hop audience in there. And you could go deep. You could go, you know, you could play those album cuts. You know, you could play those back-in-the-day joints that people, oh, I haven't heard this tune in years, yeah? But then if it was a Friday or a Saturday and it's just free entry, then... Um, I'm, you know, I'm playing from 9 till 1 a.m., so I'm essentially my own warm-up DJ. You know, uh, wh when, the, uh, when the venue opens, people are still having dinner, so the, the levels are fairly low. You want to be able to, you know, allow them to enjoy their evening. You know, you'd, you don't want to be the center of attention while they're there just chilling, having the meal, trying to catch up. They might be romancing, you know what I mean? They might be having a meeting, whatever. You know, they, they've not necessarily come out to dance or to listen to music just yet. You know, so there's an there's understanding the time and the place, right? People are still chilling. So the kind of music I would play during those moments is, the, in fact, I would enjoy that more because it would allow me a, a little opportunity to kind of experiment, play the kind of cuts that you can't necessarily play later on. Um, and, you know, it gave you a kind of chance to try out music. And more often than not, that was when I would often get people coming up to me, asking me about music. And for me, you know, like being a good DJ, it's about essentially two things. It's about hearing and sharing, right? When you hear a new cut, a new track, something you've never heard before, and your first instinct is, I can't wait to share this. I can't wait to play this out, you know? And then uh, second, you know, so you hear it and then you share it, right? So... Uh, uh, who's this? Uh, Amelia, and he's saying start playing something, man. I, 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 I'll do a little something in a minute. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, anyway, look, uh, for those just joining us, welcome to the Fortress of Solitude, aka DJ Shorty Studio. We're just talking about how to be a better DJ, you know. So, anyway, look, like I say, rule number one know your music, you know. N number two, understand your audience and where you are playing. Right. And again, I might have said this in the previous video, but understand that you've got a job to do. You know, more often than not, you know, if you're going to be a successful DJ, the gigs will be varied in terms of audience and, you know, where you're playing. You might have to play the odd wedding or birthday party, especially if you want to make that pee. Right. And then, you know, look, I, I wish all power to you. I hope you all become superstar DJs. I hope you all blow up the spot and people are willing to pay a hundred pound a ticket to come and see you rock Wembley Arena. You know, but until that day comes, chances are a venue owner, a bar owner, uh, you know, where, whether it's a club or a bar or wherever you've gone to play, they've hired you on the strength that they need a DJ to come and spin some tunes to keep the crowd happy, to keep the people dancing, spending money, you know, uh, and coming back. Right. So if you do a good job there, if you make sure the punters have a good time, then th the management have had a good time and they're going to they're going to want you to come back. Right. Whereas if you go in there with an ego in that I'm going to play what I want to play and you're going to like it l or lump it, you're not going to last very long. You know what I'm saying? So always be aware of what's expected of you, because in those situations you are doing a job. You have been hired by someone to fulfill a service. And, you know, this is true. Whatever you know, world you're in, whatever job you do, one thing I say all the time, do a good job, be reliable, the work will come to you. You know what I'm saying? So there's that side of it. Now going back to the music, a way I would often prepare for sets is um, the analogy I often draw is like, say, football. Yeah. Now when you're training as a footballer, you practice set pieces. Yeah. You practice how to take a corner. You practice how to take a penalty. You know, uh, the, the reason being is you may not necessarily know when you're going to need these skills, but there will be a time when it comes up and when it happens, you're ready for it. You know what I'm saying? So that can be from either small things about just familiarizing yourself with the equipment down to how you actually put your set together. Now, a, a method I use for practicing sets um, I'll, so I'll pick a theme or just a subject, like l l whatever it is. Let's say you're getting ready to play out at an event. You know what kind of, uh, you know what kind of event it's going to be, right? But you don't have anything prepared. So if I'm going to prepare a set, first thing I always do is I I get a rough idea of 
the music that I want to play. Now, if I'm actually playing from vinyl, then that means going to the crates, pulling out the records that I want to play, and uh, you know, bringing them over to the decks and actually spinning them, having a little go with them. If I'm DJing digitally, uh, you know, get, I'll create a digital crate. I'll you know, I'll virtually dig through my records and uh, pick out the tracks that I want to play. Now that's that's the selector side of it. I'm gonna play this joint. Gonna play this joint. Gonna play this one. Boom, 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 boom. But that's just the first step. Now you've got to sequence them. You've got to put them in order. You've got to have them arranged in such a way that it works as a coherent set. Now, the way I used to do this back in the day is um, firstly, if it was vinyl, you pull out the records and then you just have a mix with them, right? I would record that mix and then I would play it back to myself and critique it. Okay, that bit banged. That bit was a little bit dry. This bit could be better. I'm going to move this bit to there, that bit to there. And then you have another go. You do it again and then you play it back and you critique it again and you continue this process and it's just a constant refining, 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 and then you will eventually get to a point where you're happy with the set, you're happy with the order, you understand the transitions, how best to mix them, how to use the EQs, any effects, you know, and once you're at that point, now you can record it, put it online, start sharing it, but also now you've got a set for when you play out, you know, and it, it, it takes a certain amount of practice and a certain amount of skill before you can get to the point where you're just winging it. And I'll be lying if I said I haven't done that in the past. But I always try and be prepared for what, whenever I'm doing a set because it just means that the, the quality of what you're delivering is that much better, you know? So picking out the tracks, put them in an order, test it out, refine it, keep doing that process until you know you've got a solid set, whether that's half hour, hour, two hours, three hours, however long, you know, and you just repeat this process. Now, <clears throat> again, when it comes to playing out, there is a big difference between the peak time DJ and the warm-up DJ. As I was saying about the chip shop example, I'm essentially my own warm-up DJ. Like those first couple of hours is pretty chilled out. And then later on, it gets peak. You know, people start dancing and jumping around and, you know, we clear the tables. That's a different style of set, you know. And that's, um, that's often the case. So, like, know what time you're playing, if you're playing out, and if there's going to be other DJs. Have an idea of what kind of music they're going to play. Maybe do a little bit of homework because you don't want to be playing the same cuts as every other DJ. You want something that makes you stand out, you know. Uh, one thing that's always been true is that it is very easy to just, uh, you know, rock up at a spot and play, you know, the latest big tunes, you know, like the Beatport Top 10, whatever the, the hottest jams are right now. Um, that will work to a certain degree because what will, you know, the people will enjoy themselves, they know the music, they'll dance, they'll sing along, but they'll forget you, you know. Um, if you really want to have some sort of impact, you have to do something that's going to set you aside from all the other DJs. And that's something that we're going to get into in a minute, you know, just about originality, about how to add a little bit of flourish to your mix. Something that makes you stand out from the crowd so that when it's all said and done, when they leave the spot, they remember you. You know, also, you know, the, the people that run the venue, you want to leave a lasting memory for those guys. So, you know, when it's when it's over, you're not just some random face that disappears into their memories. You're the DJ that stood out. You're the DJ that made their night for them. You're the DJ that rocked the spot so hard that they can't wait to come back and see you again. You know, this is how you build a fan base. This is how you build credibility. And uh, this is how you stand out from the crowd. I mean... So many DJs now, uh, look, the, the, when I first started, it was hard to get into it. The biggest factor being the cost of the equipment, the cost of the vinyl, like a pair of Technics, you're looking at a grand, you know, plus a mixer. Then you've still got to buy the vinyl, right? That was a, that was a big factor, but it, it also meant that unless you were really about it, you didn't become a DJ, you know? One of the great things about technology now is it's so much more accessible to people. Uh, you know, it's both a gift and a curse because what it means, like, I I'm so glad that now, you know, more people are getting the opportunity to be DJs, to learn these skills, to get involved in it. But what it also means is that there's a lot more chaff with the wheat, you know what I'm saying? And you've got to sort it. You, you know, you got if you're going to stand out, you know, you can't just be the same old button bashing, playing the same old tracks. You know, you've got to have something about you that will make you stand out from the crowd. So, you know, 
that doesn't necessarily mean having the newest tunes, but it means having the best tunes, you know. And I like to pride myself on being able to both look back, pull out classic tracks that be haven't been played in years, or if I'm going to take a track that might be a little bit bait, might be a little bit obvious, then what can I do with it? to make me stand out from the crowd. You know, whether that's taking an acapella and putting it over a different beat. Uh, if you don't understand what I mean by that, we'll get into that in a minute. But essentially the acapella is just the vocals of the track. So you take that vocal and then you flip it, you throw it over the top of something else. Or, you know, if you're into productions, you know, start doing your own edits, start doing your own remixes, get into that exclusive club, you know, where people are now coming to you like, oh, you played that remix or you played that version of whatever track. Where can I get that? Oh, well, that was my cut. That's an exclusive cut, you know, and that kind of harkens back to the original days of DJing. You know, when when the hip hop like scene first started, there was no hip hop scene. It wasn't like you could go and buy some instrumentals for MCs to spit to the DJs had to take it upon themselves to search out for original breaks, original beats. And those beats would come from a variety of sources. You know, uh, like a, a, a classic example is When the Levy Breaks by Led Zeppelin. That's got this sick break beat at the beginning of it, you know, which has been used endlessly on hip hop. But that's Led Zeppelin, right? Then you've got um, Apache, you know, by uh, the Incredible Bongo Band. The original version of Apache was by Hank Marvin and the Shadows. That's Cliff Richards' band, you know what I'm saying? Cliff Richards' band are responsible for one of the dopest hip-hop breaks ever, right? So I encourage you to listen to as much different music as you can because you never know where inspiration is going to come from. But going back to what I was saying about the DJs in the early days, when they would find these records, they used to peel the labels off them because you'd have a nosy DJ sort of looking over your shoulder, oh, what's, what's, what's that cut, what's that cut? And they didn't want you to know, right? And, uh, you know, you knew if, you, if certain tracks, if you wanted to hear certain tracks, there was only certain DJs that had them and the only place you would hear them is either if they were playing on the radio or if you went and watched them live at a gig, you know? That principle still stands true today. I know it's a lot easier. I see it all the time. I'll be spinning and you can spot people breaking out their phones, hitting the Shazam. What is this track? Oh, sick. Okay, now I've got it. Like, it's as easy as that. You know, it's not like back in the day where you had to go digging for it, you know. Now, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not Philistine. I'm not going to hate against people embracing the technology. A big part of what I'm trying to do here today is talk about how the technology has evolved from the original traditional old school analog way of DJing to the more digital stuff that's happening now. You know, I'm a Serato user, but there are several software packages out there for DJs if you're getting started. You know, Serato seems to be the popular one at the moment. Um, they were one of the earliest ones to get into the game. You know, there was a, a package back in the day called Final Scratch. And that got bought out by Native Instruments. And, the, you know, they worked together with the Tractor team to bring out Tractor. There's Virtual DJ. Pioneer have got their own software called Record Box. So y you have many options available to you um, in terms of virtual DJing. Now, how the virtual compares to traditional will vary, right? You know, uh, but the, the, the skills are transferable. You know, number one, like I say, know your music, have a good music collection and understand your music. You know what I'm saying? So uh, uh, Rhyme sent a request to be in your video. Sorry, Rhymes, I, I, uh, I, I, can't, I can't do that. I'm just doing a little takeover for an hour while I deliver this seminar. But I appreciate you getting involved. But look, listen, look, anyone out there watching, listening, uh, if you've got a specific question you want to ask me, today's session is about preparation and, uh, you know, getting creative. But if you have a specific question that you want to ask me, by all means, hit me up. You know, uh, if you've got a specific bit of kit, if you're using a controller, if you're on CDJs, as I said, a lot of these skills are transferable, right? So uh, how are we doing? Okay, we, yeah, we've still got time. Now, as I said, preparing for a set, it's, 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 you know, as the saying goes, fail to prepare, prepare to fail, you know? Um, because with the best laid plans, you want to have backup plans as well because you might have an idea of what you're going to play. You might even have your set planned out to the finest like detail, like I'm gonna hit my mix there, I'm gonna hit the blend there, I'm gonna do some cuts and scratches there, boom, 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 boom. But then you get to the spot, you get to the venue, and it's nothing like you expected it to be. The audience is different, or the age group is inappropriate, or they're just not feeling what you're playing. That's the worst one, 
right? You gotta have enough confidence in yourself to not let the ego get the better of you. And what I mean by that is, if you're not, if they're not feeling it, n- know enough to stop or to change what you're doing. Don't be so like adamant that yo, I'm gonna play what I'm gonna play, and you lot are gonna like it or not. Like that's not gonna get you very far. As I said earlier, if you want to be a good DJ, if you want to be a successful DJ, adapt, adapt. You know, adaptability is key. You know, and being able to cater to other people's taste, other people's, you know, preferences, that's a big part of it, yeah? So, now, when it comes to originality, there's a few different things you can do. I would say step number one is your choice of music. As I've already mentioned, preparing it is one thing, knowing it is another, but try and be original in your choice of songs. There's certain songs that, as a DJ, I don't play, even though I love them right the reason for that is i feel like i feel like it's just a sloppy move i feel like it's a cheap move um number one prime example would be say house of pain jump around um some of you younger cats might not know that tune if you're of my generation you definitely know that tune but in any case my point is it's it's like a big party anthem and it's one of those tunes that i hear dj's drop all the time when they can't get a reaction out of the crowd, when it's just not happening. You know what I mean? Like, people aren't really feeling it. So there's that temptation. Okay, let me drop this tune because I know people are going to react to it. And, um, you know, of course they do. uh, But then where do you go from there? You know, I try and... I I call them like desperation tunes. You know, I'm getting desperate. I'm running out of ideas. What can I play? Oh, I know. I'm going to play this. And, um, you know, like I say... It's a cheap move, man. I, I, I like to challenge myself as a DJ. I like to think that I can get the party rocking without dropping them kind of jams. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I've got those jams. I've got that cut on vinyl and I've got remixes of it and I've got various different bootlegs of it. Um, like Again, that comes back to what I was saying about if you are going to play something obvious, then, um, then you, you know, just... Um, <laughs> Try something new with it. Okay, I've got a question uh, coming in. Uh, I've been in that situation. That's why I'm rebranding myself as a DJ. Okay, uh, whoever that was, I think that might be Dave. Uh, So, David, shout out to you. Yeah, look, however you want to put yourself out there as an entertainer, I think these same rules apply, right? Whether you're an artist in terms of a performer, in terms of singing or rapping, you need to have some originality about you and you need to be able to show that you're not the same old, same old. You know, there's something about you that's going to pique people's interest. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, big up to Medi. I see you. Shout out to everyone getting involved. Once again, we are live on both the Soapbox and Young Urban Arts Foundation Instagrams. Uh, Shout out to the whole Soapbox team. We've got a wicked schedule of all kinds of workshops, whatever you're into. We, can't, we do all kinds of di- digital media, you know, music production, video editing, podcast, as well as uh, digital tech, you know, games design, 3D printing, all of that. If you want to find out more, uh, check out the Instagram or head, out, head to the website, Soapbox Islington, and uh, Young Urban Arts Foundation, man. These guys, shout out to Kerry, shout out to Tash, shout out to Debbie, everyone behind the scenes at UF. We've been putting in work for a long time, doing a lot of similar sort of stuff. They've got an amazing schedule as well, so do check them out online. Now, uh, where was I? Originality, yeah. So, as I was saying, there's... there's the, there's the little things that you can do to make you stand out from the crowd, whatever kind of artist you are. And um, so when it comes to DJing, for me, one of the, the, the all right, first there's the visual spectacle of it. Like, and, you know, things like scratching, you know, we call it turntablism once, once you reach a certain level. Because the idea is, is like, look, if you, if you play an instrument, let's say you play a guitar, you're a guitarist. If you play a violin, you're a violinist, right? Well, we play the turntables, so we call ourselves turntablists, you know? Now, I'm not saying you've got to have the dopest skills. You ain't got to be the sickest turntablist out there. But just having a little something in your, you know, in your bag that you can show a little, chicka, chicka, wicka, wicka, you know, it makes you stand out, right? It gets people's attention. Oh, wow, what's he doing? What, what's going on there? What are you doing behind the decks there? But also, you can't do that all night. It gets no- you know, it gets irritating. Some people don't like it, you know, and if you're not very good at it, it does sound a lot like noise, you know? So um, adding a little flourish every now and then with some scratching or some beat juggles makes all the difference, you know? But then also, it's a case of how you combine the songs, you know? 
Uh, oh, actually, let me pause. I jumped over something. Now, um, I mentioned this last week. When it comes to digital DJing, a big helping factor is Serato and the way that Serato enables you to manage your files. Now, if you're joi- excuse me, if you're joining me on the Zoom, um, sorry, bear with me a second. Right, if you're joining me on the Zoom, we've uh, I'm sharing my uh, my laptop screen right now, and uh, there, there's a lot of functionality built into Serato to help you, and pretty much all digital DJ tools have the same functionality. So. In the way I was talking about, if it was vinyl, I would go out and I would pick out my tunes and put them in order and rework that order. Serato has a built-in functionality that will help you do that process. Step one is you can create a virtual crate. Um, so you, you just drag and drop files into that crate. And then there is, if you, okay, so again, you can't really see this if you're on the Instagram. I'm sorry about this. It's a bit difficult for me to move the laptop around. So if you disconnect your laptop from your Serato, um, Serato is still open, and depending on which version you've got, Serato DJ Pro allows you to DJ offline. There's virtual tools built into the software that you can still spin with it. But um, right above where the track listings, where your tracks are listed, there is a button that appears called Analyze. It says Analyze Files. What you can do with that once you create your crate, you can drag that crate onto the analyze files and it will scan all of the tracks within that folder. And it will, firstly, it will normalize the audio. If, that con- if you don't understand what that term means, basically it sets a uniform standard volume for all of the tracks. So if you've got a really loud track, you can choose what you want that level to be, but uh, whatever it is, it standardizes everything to that volume. So if you've got a really loud track, it will pull it down a little bit. If it's a quiet track, it pulls it up. And that means you've got consistently a selection of tunes that all run at a decent volume level. And um, But it, within that process, once it's analyzed the files, it will bring up a lot of other information. Really important bit of information is the bit rate. That, that will give you an idea of the quality of the sound files that you're using. Um, I'm quite a stickler for good sound quality, but I'm not against using an MP3. If I do use MP3, I know iTunes only go up to 256K. Bandcamp will allow you up to 320. Um, Also, Bandcamp gives you the options of lossless audio, so whether you want WAVs or FLACs or AICC files. the, the, The lossless audio takes up more space on your hard drive, so... Be aware of that. You don't want to sacrifice too much hard drive space. Now, for the most part, when it comes to audio files, if you're just listening on your little earbuds or you've got them on headphones or a a basic sound system at home, you can't really hear too much sound difference here. But if you've got a good set of studio monitors or you're in a big club with heavy duty speakers and, you know, powerful amps driving that sound, it really does make a difference to the sound quality. And, uh, you know, you want to be using as good quality sound files as you can. Now, uh, so the other bit of information it will bring up, it will tell you how long the track is, but it also analyzes the track and will detect the BPM of the track. That's a really useful tool. If you don't know what BPM is, it's a term it stands for beats per minute, as in how many, one, two, three, four, how many beats in a minute, right? Now, different musical genres run at different speeds, different BPMs. My favorite era of hip hop is like kind of late 90s, early 2000s, boom bap hip hop. That's around that 90, 100 BPM, you know. You know, um, then like house music is more around that 120 to 130 beats per minute. So, you know, then once you start getting into like drum and bass, that's hitting them 170s, 175, 180s, you know. And, um, you know, depending on the BPM, we'll decide whether or not you're able to mix the two tracks together. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Shout out to NGA087. What are you saying? Uh, Yeah, hello to you too. Hello to everyone getting involved. Uh, So once you've got the BPMs analyzed, you can, the, the tabs that run across the top of the window, you know, you've got song, you've got artist, you've got BPM, you've got length, you've got bit rate. You can choose to arrange that folder by any one of those parameters. So boom, if you hit the the BPM button, it will go from slowest to fastest. That's a really helpful tool. 
right? You know, because boom, like it's basically sorted them into order for you. You might want to refine which ones you play where, but you know, like this folder that I'm looking at now starts off at 70 into 72, goes to 77, 80, 90, 90. You know, the BPMs just go up like that. And you, it gives you a good indication of what track will mix with the next one. You know what I'm saying? So that's a really useful tool, the analyze files function within Serato. Um, when it comes to picking what level the audio is normalized to, up in the top right corner, there is a little cog button, which is basically your internal settings for Serato. So you can go in there, have a little look around, familiarize yourself with it, and pick a, a, a level that you want your music to, to be settling in at. Now, once you've uh, once you've prepared your music, once you've got your crate ready, you know now it's now it's time to DJ, right? You know, and as I said, there's a lot of trial and error involved in putting together a good set, but there's no substitute for practice. I fully appreciate. Uh, oh, the sound keeps tapping out, mate. I'm really sorry. I'm not sure what's going on with the sound, guys. Um, now. If you're having trouble on the Soapbox Instagram, I know we are also live on the Young Urban Arts Instagram. That's UF official, Y-U-A-F official. And let me just uh, have a little tinker with these cables. Sorry about this. This is, uh, yeah, it might be the connection. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It probably is the connection. Um, hopefully, how's that now? Can you still hear me? Anyway, big up to p -talk. It's clicking. It's clicking. What's causing the clicking? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. You know, this, like I say, this is a uh, a learning curve for all of us. So um, shout out to everyone that's uh, that's getting involved, being part of it today. Now, um, okay, I've lost my screen. That's not a good start. There we go. All right. Okay. So that's the basics of pr pr preparation. Know your music. Pick an order. It clicks when I talk. Okay, so maybe I'm too loud. Uh, I'm just going to turn it down a little bit. Hopefully that will... Um... How's that? Is that better? Has that stopped clicking? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, I appreciate you guys watching and being involved. We're still ironing out the uh, the creases on this whole technical streaming, working from home lot, you know. But um, I hope you're all staying safe. I know it's a madness out there. You know, um, the... the <laughs> We're not going to get into it. You know, we all know why we're doing what we're doing. You know, the, this COVID-19 has got the world in a madness. So I know there's mixed messages coming from the government. My advice to you is don't take any unnecessary risks. Your haircut can wait. You know what I'm saying? Stay at home. Stay safe. Just hang out with us. Learn some skills. You know what I'm saying? You know. But anyway, so look, once you're, once you're prepared, once your music selection is on lock, you've practiced your set, now you're ready to go out and rock it, right? Now, as I was saying, there's certain things that you can do to make yourself stand out from the crowd. A little bit of originality goes a long way. One of those things is scratching. So um, let me le let me show you a little something about scratching, yeah? I'm gonna, uh, firstly, uh, let me... Uh, I'm going to put the mic in the mic stand to free up both my hands. Now, scratching was kind of invented by accident just by the way that vinyl works, yeah? Now, imagine... Uh, it was a guy called Cool Herc. Uh, cool Herc cool Herc was uh, considered like the pioneer, the guy that sort of started the hip-hop foundation, hip-hop movement in the way that he DJed. He would look for original breaks, and he, you know, he, he would... He would when he DJed, he didn't play the whole song. He would just pick out little sections and play the breakbeat. And uh, there's a guy called Red Alert who is credited as the guy who came up with the idea of scratching. Now let me just load something up here. Now the idea with scratching, imagine, imagine the records playing, and you have to, you have to, beating most of the you catch it because you want to start at say that point. So I've caught it, and just to make sure I had the right sound, I was just rubbing it backwards and forwards. And behold, the scratch was born. You know, th when it comes to scratching, oh my God, like, there, there is so many different techniques and patterns, and uh, if you're a beginner DJ, it can be very overwhelming, right? 
but I'm going to show you a couple of basic things now to help you get started. Just so the idea is, is that you understand what's going on technically. I just want to demystify it for you so that next time you see a DJ playing, whether it's in real life or whether you're watching online, uh, I mean, big up to like, um, oh, the name escapes me now. Who are the guys that have got all the videos online with the DJs? Boiler Room. Boiler Room is who I'm thinking of, sorry. So once you understand how the equipment works, all of a sudden, like it makes a big difference to your understanding of what's going on. Because now they're not just mysteriously, magically pressing buttons and doing something. You actually understand the mechanics of what's going on behind the scenes. It will help you grow as a DJ. Now, uh, whether you're using... Vinyl or, you know, and let me just adjust this camera a little bit so you can see what's going on. One second. Okay, so whether you, I'm using vinyl in this situation, hooked up to my laptop running Serato, um, but if you're using a controller, uh, the, the principles are very much the same. Also, if you're using CDJs, they are very similar to how... Uh, uh, if you're using a controller, it's very similar to how CDJs work. Sorry, let me just adjust this. One second. All right, that's going to have to do. Now, um, okay, so when I press start on the turntable, it starts spinning, obviously, right? When you press play on a CDJ, you've got a digital dial on the top, which has a rotating platter, which is designed to kind of mimic what's going on here with the turntable spinning, right? Now, you'll notice on the, the CDJ or the controller, there is a line that just rotates like, it's on, like, a, like the second hand on a clock face, going round and round. Clockwise is forward, anti-clockwise is reverse, right? So the reason I say that is that line that's moving, you can use that as a visual reference point to help you with your scratching. Now, when I'm DJing, I, I've put a marker on my record here. I don't know if you can see that. Let me just hold this up. So you see how I've put that arrow on there? There's a reason for that. So the arrow I use to help me know where my sounds are. It used to be if it was a real bit of vinyl, we would put the needle on the record, find the sound, and then put a sticker on pointing at the needle. Some people prefer like the 12 o'clock clock face kind of thing. But just a way of knowing where the sound starts. I like to use the alignment with the needle, right? So anyway, look, I line up the arrow with the needle, and then I pick the sound I want to scratch with. In this case, it's a sentence that says, all that scratching is making me itch. Now that lasted about one and a half revolutions. So if I spin it back, back to where the needle is pointing at the record, um, at the needle, sorry, where the arrow is pointing at the needle, I know I'm back to the beginning of the sample, right? So. So. That is both a visual cue and an audio cue to keep you aware of what's going on with the decks. You know, now the first scratch that we, you know what, so we've got a sentence there. All that scratching is making me itch. All that scratching is making me itch. And then we've got that at the end. I'm going to use that to show you a couple of things, yeah? So the first scratch that every DJ should learn, we call it the, ba uh, the baby scratch, yeah? And that's simply. Whatever sound you've caught, whatever sound you're using, you catch it. You make sure you're holding it underhand. That, and uh, you just rub back and forth. That is your basic scratch. Like sort of starting just before the sound starts, going over the beginning of it. And by changing how fast or how slowly you go, you can add some inflection into the sound. So if I do, if I do a slow one, or I do a quick one, or you combine the two. You see what I mean? Now, that's just one sound, right? The, the 
like with music, you don't want to play the whole the same song over and over and over again. You don't want to scratch with the same sound over and over again. You want to put a little bit of variety into it. And, you know, that's where things like this sentence come in. You see what I'm saying? And it just gives it a little bit of variety, gives it, you know, gives the audience something to listen to. But also it, it changes up the sound so it doesn't stagnate, right? So you've got the basic just going backwards and forwards. Chicka, 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 right? Wiki, wiki. Right? And as I said, by changing the speed and, you know, the rhythm of what you're doing will give you the inflection. So then the next step, it's, quite, it's often joked about, I do this all the time when I'm teaching people how to DJ in real life. If you want to be good at scratching, you need to be able to differentiate between what each of your hands is doing. Now, I am, my, my dominant hand is my right hand. When I first started to learn to scratch, I used to have my right hand on the deck because that was, you know, where, where most of the action was happening. But then as I progressed, I quickly learned that actually some of the more complicated stuff that's going on is on the crossfader, right? Because once you start involving the crossfader in what you're doing with the scratches, you can change the patterns. So, for example, that baby scratch has got a forward and a backward stroke. Forward, back, forward, back, right? Now, the crossfader, the volume fader here is like a, it is exactly that. It's a volume fader. It gradually gets slower and it, it gradually gets louder, quieter. So, whereas I've got the crossfader set to be an instant on and off. It's off, it's on. So what that means you can do is now you can start interfering with how your patterns are rolling on, on the decks, right? So what I mean by that, you've got the forward and the backstroke, right? Let's say I turn it off on all of the backstrokes, you only hear the forward stroke. You see what I'm saying? And then um, you can start alternating it, like on, off, on, off. That gives you the... You see what I'm saying? Now, of course, I've been doing this for years. I make it look easy when you're up here and just... Right? There's no substitute for practice. If you can get your hands on any kind of decks, whether it's a controller, CDJs, vinyl you need to put in hours practicing to get good at this side of it, right? But that's just like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to patterns and, you know, styles of scratching. Uh, the, 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 one of the most popular scratch moves is called transforming, and that's where you're rapidly clicking it on and off whilst doing the baby scratch. So, so if I start off with the baby scratch, and then I start transforming on the crossfader, it gives you... You see what I'm saying, right? So these are just small steps. You know, you, you, you want to get used to the physicality of it. Because, for example, if I just let the record play, you get a, you know, you hear the su sample. But if I actually push it forward, it speeds it up and there's more like a stab. You see what I mean? Now, depending on what tempo of music you like to play is going to make a big difference on your scratch patterns, how the scratching sounds. One thing I will say, don't go overboard. Chances are there will only be a small, peop small percentage of the audience that actually appreciate and understand what you're doing and will give you props for it. For the most part, it will go over people's heads. Some people might clock that, oh, he's doing something different there. That, look at that DJ. What's that DJ doing? Look, they're scratching, you know. And um, that makes a big difference in terms of just impressing them. But if you're playing for hours, you don't want to be doing that all night because people will get fed up of it. They will get bored of it, right? So, um, okay. So once you've... Um once you get comfortable with the baby scratch, a good thing about Serato, if you're using a controller, now this mixer I'm using is the Pioneer DJ MS9. It is specifically built to work with Serato. It connects directly to my laptop. I've got these keypads here, um, which allow me to jump to predetermined cue points. I set those cue points. I decide what those sounds are. So if I run through them, the first one is this. Yeah. Second one is this. 
third one, all that scratching. All that scratching. <laughs> The funky beat. <laughs> the funky beat. <laughs> cut the music. Now, what that allows me to do is to quickly jump between samples. Remember what I was saying is about, about how you don't want to get stuck on the same sample over and over again. You know, you want to be able to shift around with sounds, yeah? So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the funky beat. All that scratching is making me itch. All that <laughs> quickly jumping between samples, you know? Um, that's helpful in itself but also takes a lot of preparation knowing which sounds work best different sounds work better for different types of scratching for example um, this sort of sound is like we call it the crash because it's a big <coughs> right but then you've got the the vocal sample which like if I use that all that scratching all that scratching the best vocal sounds to scratch with are vowels a e i o you, you, I suppose, but a, you know, it gives you that R, E, you know, you get those nice clean sounds, which uh, are a lot easier to scratch with. You know, uh, S's are really difficult. It depends what follows it. I mean, you got, you can hardly hear that S on that. But anyway, look. Being able to scratch will definitely set you apart from the other bog standard DJs just doing the same old, same old, you know. Then, you know, I, I mentioned, for anyone who's interested in scratching, we're going to do a whole session on scratching in the coming weeks. We're taking you step by step, you know, easing you into it, right? So um, this, what I'm using to scratch with here, you can make your own one. You can collect your own sounds and samples, edit them together. These are what we used to call battle weapons. The phrase comes from D like DJ battles, like the DMC or Vestax or ITF would hold annual DJ competitions where you would get literally three minutes to battle another DJ with your sickest scratches and cuts and routines. And... Um, Sorry, I just had to dip to the crate. So here's some examples of battle weapons. These are records which are put together by one of my favorite DJs, Qbert, him and his crew, um, the Invisible Scratch Pickles, big up to Mixmaster Mike, Shortcut, all of the OG turntablists, you know what I'm saying? Now, the idea, like, they're on a label called Dirt Style. Now, there's no songs on these records. It's just a collection of samples and sounds and breaks and beats, right? So the idea was when you went into one of these DJ battles, you would take these along with you to help you. <clears throat> and uh, they became known as battle weapons, yeah? Now, or your battle wax, right? Now, trust me, I've gone through so many copies of some of these vinyl. And uh, th they just get battered because the needle wears out the vinyl, right? But nowadays in the digital era, a lot of these guys have uh, reissued them as downloadable audio files. So... This one that I'm scratching with is actually, it's actually a digital version of this record. It's called uh, Dirt Style Shampoo, <laughs> right? Yeah, they were always weird. They were always weird, yeah. But, yeah, what it means is now you buy it once as a digital download and I've instantly got two copies of it, right? And uh, also, the sound quality never deteriorates, yeah? So... If you look, look up Dirt Style, Peanut Butter Wolf is another good one. He had uh, a, a break, breaks record that he put out called Super Duck Breaks. Um, th there's so many of them out there. Now, there are tools out there to help you build your own. And I do encourage you to try and do that. You know, because again, this is another thing that's going to make you stand out from the other DJs. is just having your own samples and your, other, your own sounds, right? Now, uh, like once you've got your sounds and your samples, it's how you use those in the mix. As I said, don't go too overboard. You know, people will get fed up of it. But another trick I like to um, put into play when I'm DJing is uh, the use of acapellas. Yeah. Now, uh, again, if, you, if you're not familiar with the term acapella, basically it's just the vocal of a track, right? And it, y you can take that vocal and then you can flip it by putting it over a different beat. Yeah, and then, you know, you've essentially created your own remix. Now, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So, let's say, um, 
shout out to all my hip hop heads out there. There's a incredible track by Mob Deep. Mob Deep, a classic hip hop act from the nineties. And now to some people, let me play if I just play you the beat, you'll recognise the beat. Hang on. Now to a certain younger generation, they know this as the eight mile tune. The tune where uh, Eminem just rips the the last cipher at the end of uh, 8 Mile is over this beat. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that same track now, on this deck, I've got the a cappella, which is just the vocal from that track. I got you stuck off the realness. We be the infamous, you heard of us. Official Queensbridge murderers. The okay, so the first thing you could do, like the obvious thing, would be um, to just put it over another hip-hop instrumental, right? So let's say... Oh, again, by the way, be aware of BPMs. That that track runs at like 93 BPM. So if I take... Okay, look, let's use this. So this is taken from Dr. Dre's 2001 Chronic album, track called What's the Difference? <laughs> this beat runs at 91 BPM. Or, you know, or just under... So I'm going to have to slow down the vocal a little bit to match it, which I've done here with the pitch adjust. And then I'm going to scratch it in. I got you stuck off the realness. We be the infamous, you heard of us. Official Queensbridge murderers. The mob comes equipped for warfare. Beware of my crime family who got enough shots to share for all those who want to profile and pose. We put a little bit of echo on it to, you know, a little bit of flourish. All alone in these streets, cousin Every man for they self in his land We be gunning And keep them shook crews running Like they supposed to They come around But they never come close to So if I pull that down Just the vocal Just the beat But together That's, that's pretty basic Right, you know, in itself, it's a good idea because you know you've taken two classic tunes, and you know, so people who know either one are like, "Oh, sick, sick, sick! Look what they did with that!" Right? But then going back to what my original concept was about being original and bringing something new to the set, like you can cross blend genres. Yeah. So I know that that Shook One's a cappella runs normally at around 93, 94 beats per minute, but if I slow it down. I can bring it right into like that sort of around 86, 87, right? Now we're sort of getting into if you double time it, drum and bass territory, yeah. So let me let me find a little uh, little junglist beat here. Hang on, what have I got? All right, so let's take this tune for example. This is a track by the Easy Rollers called Hope and Inspiration. I'm going to speed it up a little bit because it only runs at 86. So I'm going to speed it up to get it up to like 89. And then we can do the same thing. And then look, what? check this out. I got you stuck off the realness. We be the infamous, you heard of us. Official Queensbridge murderers. The mob comes equipped for warfare. Beware of my crime family who got enough shots to share for all those. Who want to profile and pose? Rock you in your face, stab your brain with your nose bone. You all alone in these streets, cousin. Every man for himself in his land, we be gunning. And keep them shook crews running like they supposed to. They come around, but they never come close to. I can see it inside your face, you're in the wrong place. Cowards like you just get their whole body laced up with bullet holes and such. Speak the wrong words, man, and you will get touched. You can put your whole army against my team, and I guarantee you it'll be your very last time breathing. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So straight away, 
you know, I've taken the two different genres. I mean, I know Drum and Bass Jungle pulls from a lot of hip-hop samples already, but by just mashing those two together, that's just a little thing that you can do to make you stand out. Now, here's another trick that you can do uh, if you're using Serato or CDJs. Now, on the CDJs, there is a button that says pitch lock, right? Uh, or is it master lock, something like that. And then on the Serato, if you're looking at my screen share, there is an icon just above the dial it's like a musical note. If you click that, what it does is it locks the pitch of the record. Now, what I mean by that, f to start off with, I'm going to leave it unclicked. So if the, the record is playing... We may, I got you stuck off the realness. We what that the means, though, is if I, if I speed it... Like, let's say that's playing at 33 RPM at the moment. That's the speed that the platter is spinning at. And my pitch will allow me to adjust plus or minus 8%. But then if I press 45, that gives me a massive jump in speed. But the problem is, is it sounds like a chipmunk. So fin is where we be gunning. They keep them shut crews running like they're supposed to. They come around, but they never come close to. But if I press the pitch lock button, it allows you to change the speed, but it maintains the pitch. Read inside your face, you're in the wrong place. Cappers like you just get their whole body laced up with bullet holes and such. Speak the wrong words, man, and you will get touched. You can put your whole army against my team, and I guarantee you it'll be your very last time breathing. Now, what that is a little hack that helps you do is now you can cross blend with other musical genres. So let's, let's for example, take, uh, big up my man DJ Zink. He's a drum and bass producer, but he also kills it with like this sort of electronic house music garage stuff. I got you stuck. I got you stuck. Right, let me slow this down a little bit. Right. I got you stuck. I got you stuck. I got you stuck off the realness. We be the infamous and who of us. Official Queensbridge murderers. Tomorrow comes a quick for warfare. Beware of my crime family who got enough shots to share for all those who want to roll Fallon bones. Rock you in your face, stab your brain with your nose bone. You all alone in these streets, cousin. Every man for himself in his limb. We be gunning. They keep them shook crews running like they supposed to. They come around, but they never come close to. I can see it inside your face. You're in the wrong place. Cappers like you just get their whole body laced up with bullet holes and such. Speak the wrong words, man, and you will get touched. You can put your whole army against my team, and I guarantee you it'll be your very Last time breathing, the simple words just don't move me. You're minor, we major. You're all up in the game and don't deserve to be a player. Don't make me have to call your name out. You cool with pebble me. My gunshots will make you levitate. I'm you see what I'm saying? When the things get for real, my warm water turns colder. <laughs> So look, that's just a couple of little things that you can do to help you stand out from the crowd, yeah? Acapellas versus other tracks. If you're playing over a, not necessarily an instrumental, you want to make sure that there's no vocals on it or anything like that. We are literally about to run out of time. I was a little bit late starting, so we've probably got one or two minutes left. But before we bounce, you're like, uh, you know, I know you lot like scratching. You guys want to see some scratching? Let me uh, load up a little saying. So uh i'm gonna throw a beat on that deck and uh yeah what should we use mm -hmm. shout out to my man niles big up to all my real hip-hop heads you know what i'm saying i was supposed to be going to new york in a couple of weeks but that ain't happening you know what i mean so anyway look um, those have been the basics about preparing a set. We've got just under two minutes left before we get locked off. So big up to everyone that's been locking on. Remember, check out Soapbox and UF's schedule. We've got all kinds of workshops running over the coming weeks. Big up to everyone that's been getting involved. All of these seminars are going to be up on YouTube to refer back to. If you've got any questions, anything that you want to ask me specifically, find me online. I'm at DJ Shorty 79 And uh, make sure you follow Soapbox, follow UF. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to the whole team. Let's have a little scratch. I'm going to use this uh, old school Nas beat.
Until next week, this is DJ Shorty signing out. Peace.